I am without a bone today. That means I only have half a brain. <laughs> so I will not remember things that I should remember. I will not stop on time because it will, the alarm will not go off. So if you feel concerned about it going on too far, just raise your hand. It'll give me just some relief. She doesn't like raising her hand. <clears throat> it just seems unsubmissive. Tell your husband to be quiet, right? I think so. So we had a good vacation for those of you who are interested. We went away to Cape uh, Cod and uh, the weather was absolutely beautiful. I had the best person in the world to be with while we were there and uh, it was all really, really good. There was one day that we went to the beach. Can you imagine going to Cape Cod and going to the beach one day? Yeah, one day, and that was because the temperature was around 73 oh, every day of the week, and uh, when you get to the actual ocean uh, and the wind is blowing, that temperature goes way down. And it's not really conducive to me to be sitting out on the beach reading or wherever you want to do. So we did many other things, so we had a great time. Just spending time together was a, a blessing as well. So. We're, we're, we're supposed to start with chapter 12 today. Before we start, though, um, there's a very important event that's happening today. And it's, I know it's July 4th, and I toyed with the idea of singing the national anthem. <laughs> but there isn't a flag, so I guess we won't do that this morning. And I didn't want any of you to kneel, something like, you know, they do at baseball games or football games or whatever. <laughs> But we do have something we can celebrate, and we'll all agree that it's um, Bill's birthday, Yay! Bill Stone. Yeah, and so it's appropriate that we sing happy birthday to Bill, okay? Yeah. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Bill, happy birthday. Still have people singing when you can't join me, right? Yeah, you're welcome. Congratulations. I won't ask you how old you are. Unless you want to tell us. No. All right. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. Thank you so much for your presence with us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here this morning, too. Thank you, Father, that you're overseeing all that happens. And it is to your glory that we study your word. Help us, Lord, not just to learn what it says and understand what it means, but help us, Lord, to understand also how it applies to our lives. And may we come with a spirit of obedience, a spirit of submission, ready, happily wanting to be everything you want us to be. And so, Lord, we praise you for your work here among us, Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this morning, <clears throat> there are um, on the podium in the back, there's the outline of what we're going to do today. On the back of that outline, there is a hymn. A hymn that I have not sung before, but a hymn, <clears throat> and I've learned in this church that you're not supposed to sing something you don't know. Because <laughs> once you get up there and you start singing, and everybody knows you don't know it, they stop singing. And you're all by yourself. You know, that is not fun, okay? It is not fun, especially when they change the words behind you while you're singing. Oh my goodness. Anyway, this is a song that I want to use, and this, is a, this ends all the funniness, all right? This is about preparing ourselves for the, the study today. The writer of Hebrews, is assuming that we have read, thought about, applied, and can we remember all the things that we've studied in the rest of the book that he wrote. And so oftentimes it's good for us to have a reminder. And because it's, these words are applications that are based upon the truths that we have learned already. If these things that we have learned are, are true, then 
we have strong motivation to obey the things that are mentioned here in the passage. So I will read to you uh, this hymn, and I will remind you just very briefly about just the things in which we have covered. Not all of them, but the highlights of what we have covered. If you don't have one of these and you don't feel shame about it, you could actually go back and get another one. There's probably more back there. And uh, you could actually read the words as we read them together. If you can't do that, <clears throat> just listen. And listen with a heart um, that is very, very uh, in tune with what's going on. If somebody comes in and goes walks, walks through, don't, don't pay any attention to them. Okay, and uh, now some of these some of these lines are a little complex because they're not in an order in which we actually talk, and so I'll go back over them a little bit after we've read it, and uh, we'll make sure that everybody gets what is being said here. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis the Christ, by man rejected. Yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis the long-expected prophet, David's son, yet David's Lord. By his son, God now has spoken, tis the true and faithful word. Tell me, ye who hear him groaning, was there ever grief like his? Friends through fear, his cause disowning, foes insulting his distress. Many hands were raised to wound him. None were interposed to save. And yet the deepest stroke that pierced him was the stroke that justice gave. Ye who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil to be great, there may here may view its nature rightly, where its guilt may estimate. Okay, I'm gonna talk about that one there. That's a little convoluted. You who come here thinking little of sin, that's what it's saying here. Or do you not suppose that evil is great? Here you may actually see its nature correctly. Here, the guilt of sin you may estimate because of what you see. Mark the sacrifice appointed. Look at the sacrifice appointed. See who bears that awful load. It's the word, the Lord's anointed, son of man and son of God. Here we have a firm foundation. Here the refuge of the lost. Christ's the rock of our salvation, he, the name on which we boast, his, the name on which we boast. Lamb of God, for sinners wounded, sacrifice to cancel guilt. None shall ever be confounded who on him their hope have built. <clears throat> I think that says it all when you look back over the first part of the book of Hebrews. He starts his passage in chapter 12 with the words, therefore, therefore, always means think about what went on before that we're basing what we're saying now upon. So what went before? What went before? Given that God has spoken to us by the greatest and most dependable prophet, his own son, that's one of the things that we now consider to be a given. If it is true that Jesus is the greatest prophet, okay, given also that God has appointed his son to be our perfect high priest, who has provided a way for us to come to God, and who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sinning, <clears throat> we've come to see that as a given. That is what we consider to be true and the basis upon which we believe. Well, given also that Jesus has been exalted to God's right hand as ruler of all creation, 
and controls every event and every outcome, promising to complete what he has begun in us. That is another given that we've come to seek to be true as we have studied the book of Hebrews. Given also that many great saints of the past have put their faith in this Savior and have experienced his faithfulness <clears throat> in great deliverances and great sufferings. And since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race. Okay? Given all of these things that what Jesus said was true, and those who ignore what he says will suffer greatly of a punishment and the wrath of God, and given that God has appointed his son to be our high priest who will help us to live appropriately concerning the life that he has given us to live in. Considering also that Jesus has been exalted, he has been vindicated, that God has said, this indeed is my son whom I, believe, whom I love, and now have exalted to the right hand of my throne. All of these things lead us, along with the saints, to believe that we owe him everything, every possible interest in our lives, every possible responsibility that we own either as parents, as neighbors, as workers, as whatever it is that our Lord has given to us to do. We owe it all to him to do it in the way that honors, honors and glorifies him. So we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. What does he mean by that? Is he talking about the fact that this, the saints in heaven of the previous chapter are actually in heaven watching us? It's like a great, uh, great um, <clears throat> what do you call it when people are in an arena? Ah, thank you. Sometimes words don't come to me quickly. All right, so you think about this as a great arena with thousands and thousands of millions of saints from the past. Is it telling us that they are watching us? When Nina died, my, my daughter, who was 28, uh, those were words that rung in our hearts that um, she's now part of those, that great cloud of witnesses. But I don't think that's what it's saying. I wish it would. I wish it was. I wish you could see it. I wish you could, do. <clears throat> we could just talk to the air and she would hear. Um, I do believe that Saints that have gone before are aware to some degree as to what's happening on earth. If you hear them calling from beneath the throne to the Lord saying, how long, how long? Because they know that everything has not yet come together. Not all things are fulfilled. And so they're waiting and they're knowing that that's not what's going on yet down on the earth. So there is some awareness of what's happening and they care about those things and all of that. But it's a dangerous thing to carry that kind of logic too far. I believe there are churches that do who actually ask the saints to pray for us. And uh, I know that the saints care, but I don't see anywhere in the scriptures uh, that the Word of God teaches that they are to be prayed to so they can pray for us as if God didn't really love us enough. We need, he needed some sort of you know recommendation from a saint or from somebody that he respected. I don't think that's what we're talking about here. I think what we see here rather is that we're surrounded, surrounded by a great cloud of people who give witness to us. Who give witness to us that it is indeed the right thing. It is worth it to suffer for Christ. He is worthy of all of our obedience. They are witnessing. We have given ourselves and for many of those who are witnesses they tell us that uh, they died and some of them died horrific deaths refusing to accept freedom from prison accept freedom from execution they simply said <clears throat> it is worth it he is worth it he is almighty god 
so we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses of those who are saying to us, don't give up, don't quit, let us run the race passionately, as if it were a singular priority, that is, to win. Paul talks to us about winning a race. This is not only the writer of Hebrews. And Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do, not, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete, athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after re preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul is telling us to run the race with passion. It is not his point that we're racing against each other, because if it were, we'd all be pretty close to the back, wouldn't we? Right? I mean, there are a lot of people up there that are way ahead of us, but that's really not the, the image he's portraying. He is simply saying, in the same way as those who are in a race are really winning, running to win, you need to run with that passion. I think the church today is, is passionless in, in many ways. Now, we can get excited about things. We can have... We can have real emotional experiences. But when it comes to the everyday living of the week and the prior prioritizing of what we do, passion doesn't seem to be there. And I'm not talking about an emotional feeling. I'm talking about a deep commitment that this is my prime directive. And I'm not talking about some space show, all right, like that Star Trek, the prime directive, right? Our prime directive is to serve the Lord Jesus with all of our hearts until the end of our days. The success will be that we will not get a wreath, but we'll hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. This is our goal is to be faithful in exhibiting God's character, in loving him and the people around us the way Jesus did, to live like Jesus did. That is our calling. And so, if that be the case, then we need to run it, this race with a certain amount of trimming down the things that are all about us and not about him. That doesn't mean that there can be nothing about us in our lives. He certainly desires that our lives be filled with joy. And our, there is an incredible joy in serving the Lord. And there's also joy in going to Cape Cod, things like that, okay? But what is your prime thing, all right? What is the first thing? That if anything else comes into conflict with it, they lose, period. Because this is who I am, and this is what I do. This is kind of commitment that he's calling us to. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. And a life that has no self-control is not a godly life. It's not what the Lord is looking for. They would do it to receive a perishable wreath. The wreath I learned just the other day was either a bow of pine branch or it was parsley parsley. That's a long-lasting wreath, wouldn't you think? <laughs> uh, worth a lot. Uh, but to have it for the day and have people look at you and say, oh my, you're so awesome, is something that really draws people in. But we look for something that's imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I keep my goal in mind. And I don't box as beating the air which means I don't just flail. I just don't like to do things because that's what occurs to me. I have a plan. I have a thing 
that I'm working on because the Lord has revealed to me what my calling is. And so I, I have that which I need to consider and to do it the very best way I possibly can. This is not being the error. <clears throat> I discipline my body and keep it under control. That means pleasure has a place, but pleasure does not rule in my life. My aim does. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body, keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I find that I am disqualified. And that would be a terrible thing. Disqualified. That doesn't mean that I lose my salvation. It means that I lose the, the reward that he wants to, to give to me. Well, what is the crown that he's talking about? There are a number of passages in the Bible that refer to the crowns. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 8 is one where it, Paul speaks to Timothy saying, now there is in store for me as he's looking forward to the time of his own going home to heaven. He says there's a crown in store for me, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is a crown that we long for, that we would be totally devoid of sin, that we no longer have that, that continual ball and chain that we drag around with us that keeps us from doing what we want, what we want to do for the Lord's sake. The second one I, I read is from James 1.12, which is crown of life. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, certainly a crown doesn't separate us from others who are believers. All of us will receive a crown of life, but it is for those who complete the race, for those who are faithful to the end, that indeed they will be rewarded with a life that is glorious, a life that is fulfilling and full of joy. There's a crown of glory as well. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. A crown of glory sounds to me like his expression of appreciation, of his honoring the things that I did for him, for my love for him. None of us are going to be worthy of that, but there's that sense in which he appreciates the things we do. You know, when, when Mary anointed him with the, the perfume, um, it, it may not have been like the perfect thing, the perfect timing or whatever. It didn't matter. It, he saw into it what her heart was. And he understood what she was saying. And he appreciated it deeply. And he expressed that to the other disciples. It is the same way with us when we serve him, when we do something for others in his name because of what he has done for us. There's a great deal of appreciation. There's a lot, a lot, not a whole lot of appreciation that goes on here on this level. Most people are very reticent to give words of appreciation, which is sad because it would be that the church would be an example of people who prefer one another in honor, right? I mean, we're called to do this. And uh, it, it would be a good thing for us if each Sunday we got together, you might pick somebody out and just stop them and say, you know what, I appreciate about this about you. You know, I, like, I'm rich. I really appreciate your positive heart, Rich. You know, you're the Pied Piper with the kids, you know, right? <laughs> Today's the day. Yeah, today would be the day, right? Yeah. And you are also the person that is quick to say, you know, I love you. I appreciate you. And this is what Jesus is doing here. The crown of glory is not to say that you are some sort of exalted person, but I love you and appreciate the things that you have done. So what? these are things that should motivate us, that should say, you know what? When I get here, I might you know, get a diploma, and there's nothing wrong with getting a diploma, but that really pales in comparison with the God of the universe stands you in front of the rest of this universe and says, this is my son, this is my daughter, and let me tell you the things that he has done. Let me tell you the things that she has said and the things she has done. She has honored me in this way and this way 
in this way. He will forget nothing about your life. It really is a wonderful thing when people remember. Mina is a person who remembers things. I'm the one who needs to be reminded by her about things. But she remembers details. She remembers what you like for your birthday. So if you tell her, you're likely to get it. And you can tell it to her 10 months ahead. And she will not forget that. She latches on to those things. Her mother was like that. She learned it from her mom. So in her... When Mina would come home at, from camp or whatever, her mother would sit her down and give her devoted attention and say, just tell me about it. Tell me about your experience. What happened? And then she would respond to the stories that were told by, by just entering into the story with her emotions and her feelings. Let me tell you, that's just a wonderful, wonderful thing, an expression of true love. We need to learn to do that with each other. Remember details about, remember your kids' names. Uh, <laughs> and other kids' names, you know. That would be really good too. So, <clears throat> so he tells us then to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I don't know how to interpret, and this is not totally relevant, but it's something that just bugs me. When people just forget about what's happening, you know, like when a woman kind of leans out in the midst of the Tour de France <laughs> <laughs> with a sign so that somebody can take a selfie of her while she's there, and she causes so many people to fall, and some of them injured really seriously. I, you know, what were you thinking? Obviously, she wasn't thinking that was going to happen. And I don't fault her for that. But sometimes we, uh, we forget. And so we need to be focused upon what's really important. Set aside those things that hinder. She certainly hindered a lot of people in that race. And we also had things that just seemed like fine for us. Seem like really, you know, this is not, not bad. Certainly not. In fact, it's good. But maybe it isn't the appropriate thing. is isn't the time for it or isn't really promoting what is your prime purpose here. That always needs to be your focus. And is that helping me? Mm, no. Well, is it hindering me? It might. Then get rid of it. Get rid of it. You need to be brutal here so that you are free to be able to be used by the Lord when he calls upon you to be used. Some of us are so very busy that you know the Lord would have to really get to us a couple months ahead and say, what is your, you know, Monday on, you know, September the 9th, are you doing anything? Can you give me some 15, 20 minutes? Well, I don't know, Lord. I'll look at my calendar, right? Because we're so busy that we are not free to say, Lord, you are the Lord of my schedule. Whatever you want me to do, that is what I'm going to do. And you say, well, of course, that's how I feel too. But it isn't how you live, is it? Sometimes you don't do that. Sometimes you just sort of say, well, I, I could do that. I, I could call that person. I could go see them. But it's a busy week, and I'm tired, and whatever it might be, you know. He says, cast aside everything that hinders. Put it away. And those things, certainly the sins that you say to yourself, you know, I've got that. I mean, I've got it under control. And you know what? I'm not really sure it's a sin. It's, a, you know, something everybody is. I mean, people in the church are doing that bringing noisy cans in <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure everybody was paying attention. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, get rid of anything that's going to keep you from winning that race. My goal is to achieve what he has called me to achieve. There were things that Jesus had to say to his disciples. He waited until 
pretty much near the time of his own death. And he began to talk to them about his death. And he also talked to them about the fact that, you know what, you're going to have to, Peter, you're going to have to put your hands out. And you are going to be bound. And you are going to be taken to a place where you don't want to go. And uh, there will be things. He did not apologize to Peter. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I really wanted to give you a better life, but... Uh, you know, we're kind of tight, you know, we're kind of short on people who are really dedicated. You know, no, no apologies. This is, this is your calling. Now, you, when you think about the thing we read, or the song that we read, that when Jesus was in the garden, and he called out to the Father, if there's any other way, if the Father said no to him, you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared not to say no to God when he says, this is your call. And you need to stand for me right here. You need to say something right here. <clears throat> I know it's not going to be taken well. I know that you'll be cut off or you'll be uh, looked at strangely from now on. But you make your choice. Are you choosing them or are you choosing me? And God made no apology. He said, no, this is your path. And Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. That's what I want. And then he prayed all the more earnestly. He was not praying that God would then somehow or other change his mind. He was praying that God would give him the strength because he's telling us, even in his example, that what God calls us to do, we need God to enable us to do in our lives. And prayer is a very integral part of that. So he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Why, what joy was set before him that would lead him to enduring the cross? Scorning the shame and sitting down at the right hand of God. It was the completion of his calling. That was his prime thing, to come to glorify the Father through his complete obedience, willingness, and love. That was the joy for him. To be exalted was also joyful. To bring us to heaven with him as he prayed in John 17. Lord, I desire, Father, I desire that they be with me to see my glory. But he had a fixed purpose and goal, and he lived by it. How did he live by it? How did he? We see this in Psalm 22, where we read of his own words upon the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? The words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night. You do, But I find no rest. Here the Lord Jesus upon the cross is calling out to the Father, saying, I am overwhelmed by all that is happening to me. You are fading in my, you're fading in my ability to perceive your presence. Lord, where are you? Why, why have you forsaken me? But then he spoke to himself, as we need to speak to ourselves when we are in the midst of the sufferings he brings us into. He reminded himself that God is holy, that you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. So, Father, I am going to trust in you. I saw in the Old Testament those places of people. We saw in chapter 11 of the people of faith that God was faithful to them in the midst of their trials. But he goes on to say, I'm a worm, I'm not a man, scorned by mankind, I'm despised by the people. Isn't this a lot what we fear when we are called upon to make a witness? 
For the Lord, all who seek me will mock me. Their mouth, their mouths are, they make mouths at me. They wag their heads that he trusts in the Lord. Oh, he's a religious type. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in me. You know, may God take him. And yet, Jesus reminds himself, yet yeah, you are the one who took me from the womb. You have been faithful me to me from all of my years. You made me trust in you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. So be not far from me. Trouble is near and there's none to help. He is continually pulling himself back to the faithfulness of his heavenly father. And so that is why we are told to look to Jesus. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Look at how he handled the sufferings that he endured, the sufferings that we will endure as well. He endured the cross, suffering for the Lord, his Father. We see the same kinds of things being borne out as we read in Isaiah 53. Who's believed our, our report, what he has heard from us? And to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that he should, we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And in this, how we sometimes feel when we are given the opportunity to speak a word for Christ. Who am I? I I'm not a really good Christian. I'm, I, I don't know the Bible all that well. And, you know, I'm not too impressive as a person. I'm reminded of a song that was sung by uh, a man not many years ago, probably 30 or 40. That's a lot, yeah. Anyway, Don Francisco sung about Balaam and how uh, Balaam wanted to go forward and his donkey wouldn't and he beat his donkey and his donkey turned around and spoke to him why are you beating me and at the end of the song it says you know what <clears throat> if, the, if the Lord uses you to speak don't let it go to your head he could have used the dog next door <laughs> right he can speak through animals he can speak through you Yes, he can. If you feel like you have very little ability, certainly not about popularity, or maybe you feel like you have a lot to lose, remember this, that the Lord Jesus lost it all for you and for me. He was not respected. He was not worshipped. Surely he bore our griefs. And he carried our sorrows. Lord, I'm not sure I want to suffer that way. But he, we have screamed him stricken, stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. Oh, there's that song that we just read, right? Yeah. But he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And so may it be that there will be times when we'll speak and it will not be about us. It will be about that person. That you are speaking to their needs. And it will mean something wonderful for them, regardless of what it means for you. We're all like sheep and go astray, turn everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why should I bear cru cruel criticism for somebody that I'm really not sure I like much? Why should I have to do that? Well. He did that for us. He was oppressed, afflicted, opened not his mouth. He willingly submitted. And it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And there will be times when God will put us into sufferings. And he will use them for good purposes. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. <coughs> Jesus is our example. Fix your eyes on him and suffer in the way that he did. Consider him who endured opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary 
and lose heart because that will be your temptation to grow weary and lose heart. There may be some spurts in your life where you were really active and very useful to the Lord, but it got weary. Yeah, you were working with humans and they are such a hard bunch to work with. They don't pay attention. They don't listen to the rules. They do the only thing they want to do. They don't do what you tell them. Yeah, you could easily get tired of that and tired of them not listening. But that's what he tells us. That's what you should expect. But don't grow weary. Don't lose heart because he didn't. And he is your high priest and he will help you. He was tempted like you are, but without sin. So he knows what you should do. So accept all suffering in your path that you will find. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted the point of shedding your blood. There's the top line right there. And we suffered more than we ought to, somehow or another, and we suffered enough. I mean, after all, I'm retired now. And life should be like a coasting, right? That's how it goes, right? Okay, that's probably another one I have to throw away. <clears throat> And you're forgetting something, that discipline is included in the training of all God's children. And so if you're going to be a one of his kids, you need to understand he's going to be training you. He isn't going to leave you the way you are. Yes, indeed, he's going, he has taken away your sin, the guilt. He's taken it away and placed it upon Christ. But there is this other work that needs to be done, and that is the changing of your behavior. And to be using you for his glory and reaching out to others. So you've forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. And he quotes from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. And it goes like this. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. In other words, take it seriously. We can, we can sort of... can sort of work, you know, work ourselves into a place where we think, well, you know, that was a hard thing, but that wasn't God's discipline. He wasn't training me there. That was just, you know, things happen, right? Yeah. He says, don't, don't be a light. Don't make light of God's discipline. And don't lose heart when he rebukes you. It's easy to lose heart when somebody points out something in your heart and life that you're ashamed of. You could lose heart easily. And you could just sort of say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I know that. I, I, I know I, I do that. I know that I am not what I ought to be. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to sit down and sit on the sidelines. If I can't do it right, then why bother doing it at all? I've always had this problem. I've always struggled with these things and why should you father want to continue want to work with me he says don't lose heart why because he disciplines those he loves you were thinking his discipline was because he hates you he is tired of you he has just had it with you but he tells us very clearly he disciplines those that he cares about. And he loves us. And so if there are hardships, we need to remember the encouragement that tells us that these things are coming because he loves us. I lost my job. Does that mean he loves me? No, it doesn't not mean that. It means that regardless of what happens, he does love you. And, well, if he is in control of all things, then maybe the losing of the job is his expression of love. You need to take it that way, because otherwise you get to say, well, Lord, you're out of control. Why did this happen? Were you not watching? But you need to realize that he is in control, and the things that do happen, they happen because of his love. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. That is a validation of your sonship or daughtership. If you don't get any discipline, you should be worried because that's what God does. He trains his kids. He wants them to grow and become more and more like him. So how do I respond then? Think about what uh, David said in Psalm 32. 
Psalm 32 is his confession of his sin and about his turning away and not coming to the Lord. He says, I've learned something in this experience. Therefore, he says, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Don't wait like I did. Surely the rush of the great waters, they shall not reach him. Judgment will not be yours because you belong to him. You are a hiding place. Father, you are a hiding place to me. And I thought of you rather as a place to hide from because you are so disappointed with me because of what I've done. No, actually, I realize now that you are my hiding place and I need to run to you rather than from you. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, says the Lord. I will counsel with my eye upon you because you're, you're my child. And be not like a horse or a mule without any understanding. And it needs to be curbed with a bit and bridle. Or it won't stay near you. Why? Because many are the sorrows of the wicked. And I don't want you. Don't want you to have those. But the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice. Oh, rejoice. Oh, rise, Israelites. And shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Well, okay, so I need to listen to him. I need to realize that what he's doing in this suffering that I'm enduring is for my good because he loves me, verse 7. So endure hardship. Endure it. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Endure it. God is treating you as son. And you all know that it makes sense, don't you? For what son is not disciplined by his father? That always happens. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have had all human fathers who disciplined us and we have respected them for it, how much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? Now, I could ask, how many of you feel like you had really good parents? Okay, yeah, there are some of you who felt that way. There may be some of you, and I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, that felt that your parents were really a colossal failure in terms of raising you. Some of us have had parents who have abused us and, you know, even you know, doing terrible things. We're not talking about that. But the principle is that, generally speaking, parents love their kids and they try. Some of them have no idea how to do it because their parents never did it for them. And they don't know how to say no. Okay, we're not going to do a parenting class here. But the principle lies there that if they did as well as they did, how much better will the Lord, who does know what is, and every suffering we endure has been measured and is given to us with his oversight and love, and it's something for us to respond to. Our fathers have disciplined us for a little time as they thought best. God disciplines us for our good and we may share his holiness. That's what he wants. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. In our home, discipline was not a pleasant thing. Didn't happen often, because we were really good kids. <laughs> that was because discipline was effective. My father was... He had, had stood for no nonsense. He was a no nonsense person. And so we knew we couldn't get away with stuff with him. And we trembled when we were at the cash register, the grocery store. And I hear little kids telling their parents where to go, you know? Ah, my goodness. Some people just don't know where that's going to lead. And they need to know. Need to, but the point here is that you know, the Father in Heaven knows how to discipline us, and He will. And sometimes it's the bell that tells you when to stop, and sometimes you feel like it's the time to stop. 
You know, I don't feel that yet, so we're going to go on for one more minute. Okay. There are some people who are just so responsive to discipline. You know, you just look at them and say, and you don't say anything. And they know, and they just turn around and repent and uh, do the right thing. We had a, I, bet I watched a director, a person, the Matthew Brothers from uh, Philadelphia College, um, DBU, and they, uh, they did, led the choir for a period of time. And they led the choir with fingers. Like this, right? And the choir members were very responsive. They paid close attention to what little movements were being made. I understand that there are choir directors, and I have known some myself, that are like this, this, this. And that's, sometimes parents are like that too, right? When they could actually be like, you know, you know, and the kids then become wonderful. Right, Frank? Is that how it goes in your family? No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but we could be like that to God, couldn't we? We could just be really, really sensitive to his in working in our hearts. And so I recommend it for you and for me. We all, we all need that. So let's pray together. Father, thank you. For the example that Jesus has given to us, thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit that trains us, helps us, motivates us, empowers us, convinces us of our, our position with you being your children, loved, beloved beyond all understanding. Help us to respond in that love and trust and obedience. We pray in Jesus' name.